You know, our study of the book of Acts up to this point has, has shown us how the early church weathered several of Satan's attacks. His violence, his deception, his distractions didn't stop. and It didn't even slow down the growth of this new movement. And now it seems like everything is in place for the believers to go out into the wider world with the gospel of Jesus to fulfill that commission. Back in chapter 1, verse 8, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Everything seems to be in place. And a man named Paul is going to be the primary instrument for that. But before we get to his story, Luke is going to show us how the foundations for the Gentile mission were put in place by two other remarkable men, Stephen and Philip. These men, along with Peter, make an indispensable contribution to the global expansion of the church. And only after these men have fulfilled their mission, have fulfilled their role, can we move on to the first missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas there in Acts chapters 13 and 14. Now, the first player that we're going to talk about is Stephen. We've already been introduced to him in last week's lesson. He was one of the seven men selected to take care of the problem with the Grecian widows. And he's named in Acts chapter 6 and verse 5. But the main part of his story is told in chapter 6 beginning in verse 8 and going all the way through chapter 7 and verse 60. And that's way too much material to cover in one sermon. So I have divided this, uh, his story, the story of Stephen, divided it into two different sections. The biographical information, I guess that's a way to say, you know, who he was, what happened to him, and then his powerful sermon. So this week, we're going to talk about what Luke says concerning Stephen's ministry, and then next Sunday, we'll look at that sermon, which is absolutely remarkable. But here we we read, Acts chapter 6, beginning in verse 8. If you have your Bibles, follow along or read, read off the screen with me. I'm reading from the New Living Translation, and here's what we're told. Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed amazing miracles and signs among the people. But one day, some men from the synagogue of freed slaves, as it was called, started to debate with him. They were Jews from Cyrene. Alexandria, Cilicia, and the province of Asia. None of them was able to stand against the wisdom and the spirit by which Stephen spoke. So they persuaded some men to lie about Stephen, saying, We heard him blaspheme Moses and even God. Naturally, this roused the crowds, the elders and the teachers of religious law. So they arrested Stephen and brought him before the high council, The lying witnesses said, this man is always speaking against the temple and against the law of Moses. We have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy the temple and change the customs Moses handed down to us. And at this point, everyone in the council stared at Stephen because his face became as bright as an angel's. Now, what happens then is Stephen's sermon, chapter 7, 1 through 53. We'll look at that next week. So now we go to chapter 7, verse 54. The Jewish leaders were infuriated by Stephen's accusation, and they shook their fists in rage. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily upward into heaven and saw the glory of God. And he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. And he told them, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. Then they put their hands over their ears, and drowning out his voice with their shouts, they rushed at him, and they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. The official witnesses took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he fell to his knees, shouting, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And with that, he died. I'm going to do something very different with this than what you've ever heard before, perhaps. Didn't get this out of a commentary. At the very outset, let me tell you that I have been impressed more so recently, but in in 
recent years, been impressed with the fact that Stephen is a type of Christ. His brief story has so many parallels with the story of Jesus. I'm sure that you caught some of those similarities, but it isn't just a couple of things, folks. The parallel here is stunning. And I want to just go through it very, very quickly and then make one point at the end and we'll all go home, okay? Let's look closely at this comparison. Number one. Stephen, in our text, is said to have been full of God's grace and power. In last week's text, Luke told us that he was full of faith in the Holy Spirit. That also occurs again in our passage, that he is full of the Holy Spirit. Is that not the very same thing that is said of Jesus? John makes this statement in John chapter 3, verse 34. For he, talking about Christ, he was sent by God. He speaks God's word. For God's spirit is upon him without measure. Both men filled with the Holy Spirit, with God's grace, and with God's power. That's number one. Number two, Stephen performed amazing miracles and signs among the people. How many times is that said of Jesus? I'll remind you of one passage. He was in Capernaum, and people brought the sick. They brought the demon possessed to Jesus, and Luke says this, No matter what their diseases were, the touch of his hand healed everyone. Two men, filled with that power, do amazing miracles and wonders. Number three, Stephen, a Greek-speaking Jew, a Grecian Jew, assigned Last week, to take care of the Grecian widow problem, he goes to people like himself. The synagogue of freed men were Jews, not from Palestine, not from Judea, but from Cyrene, from Alexandria, from Cilicia, and Asia. Asia. He went to people like himself. Same thing is said of Jesus. John chapter 1, verse 11, he came to that which was his own. He came to his own people. Number four, Stephen is rejected by his own people. Those men from the free, the synagogue of freedmen, they reject him. They, they will not believe his message. So it was with Jesus. In that passage in John 1, 11, it continues like this. And his own, speaking of Jesus, did not receive him. Rejected by his own people. Number five. No one could stand against the wisdom and the spirit by which Stephen spoke. All through his ministry, Jesus also amazed and confounded people with his wisdom. A couple of incidents come to mind. Pretty early in his ministry, according to John, the chief priest sent the temple guards out to arrest him. Do you remember that? And they came back empty-handed. And they said this, No one ever spoke like this man speaks. We've never heard this before. Totally confounded by the way Jesus was speaking. John 7, 46. On another occasion, Jesus had brilliantly answered a trick question about marriage and the resurrection. Some of the teachers of the law commended him for his response. And then we're told no one dared ask him any more questions. So just like Stephen's wisdom confounded those men in that synagogue so Jesus' wisdom confounded the people around him. Number six, in the case of Stephen, when his antagonist realized that they couldn't answer his wisdom, they persuaded some men to lie about him. And if you remember, the lie had to do with what he had said about the law of Moses and the temple. Exactly the same thing happened to Christ. Mark chapter 14, verses 57 and 58 Many false witnesses spoke against him, but they contradicted each other. Finally, some men stood up to testify against him with this lie. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days I will build another made without human hands. Number seven, both Stephen and Jesus are accused of blasphemy. They are arrested and they're brought before the Sanhedrin council. Exactly the same process. Number eight. At Stephen's hearing, at his trial or whatever you want to call it, his face 
became as bright as an angel. Now, I know the immediate response is, that's what happened to Moses, right? And it is. Moses, when he came down from Mount Sinai after being in the presence of God, we're told his face glowed because he had spoken to the Lord face to face, Exodus 34, 29. But I also think of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration when his face shone like the sun and his clothing became dazzling white. Number nine, after Stephen gave his message that we're going to look at next week, the Jewish leaders are infuriated and they shake their fists at him, close their ears and then rush at him. At the trial of Jesus, after he had told them that he was indeed the son of God, the high priest tore his clothing to show his horror, shouting, blasphemy, why do we need other witnesses? And they spit in his face and they hit him with their fists, Matthew 26, 65 and 67. Number 10, Stephen was dragged out of the city to face his fate. The writer of Hebrews says this, So also Jesus suffered and died outside the city gate to make his people holy by shedding his blood. Hebrews 13, 12. Number 11, as he was dying, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. On the cross, Jesus prayed, Father, I commit my spirit into your hands, Luke 23, 46. Number 12, as he died, Stephen also says, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. Who among us doesn't remember that on the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive these people because they don't know what they're doing, Luke chapter 23, verse 34. And then finally, number 13, both men die outside the city gates, Stephen by stoning and Jesus by crucifixion. So there, 13 parallels between Stephen and Jesus. It's not an accident, folks. It's not a coincidence. And I don't think I'm speaking out of turn here. I believe there's a definite reason for this comparison at this place in the text. At the beginning of the church, beginning of this new movement, just before it goes out into all the world, Luke is saying to all Christians who ever read it, you know the story about Stephen? That's how you are to live. You are to be Christ in this world as Stephen was. Now, let me state the obvious before somebody gets all bent out of shape. I'm not suggesting that Stephen was perfect. I'm not suggesting he died for our sins as Jesus did. He was, he was a human being, no doubt. He had faults and he had failings and sins. We're not told any of that. There is nothing negative said about Stephen. Because Luke is saying, this is how you are to live. Now, in saying that we are to be Christ in the world, I'm not suggesting that we'll be perfect. But folks... Being like him, shouldn't that be the greatest desire that we have in our hearts? Shouldn't that be the goal for which all of us strive to be like him? I mean, isn't that what you want for your life? I, ask yourself that question. What do you really want for your life if it's not to be like Jesus, to be like him in the way he treated other people don't, don't you want to be like him in his obedience to the will of God? Wouldn't you like to be that committed? And to be like him in his willingness to sacrifice himself for others. That's what scripture teaches us. I remember Paul saying this. Be imitators of me just as I am of Christ. 1 Corinthians 11, 1. In other words, I imitate Christ. You imitate me and you'll be imitating Christ. Or he also wrote in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, In your lives you must think and act like Christ Jesus. And then I think of the passage in 1 John 2, verse 6. Whoever claims to live in him, to live in Jesus, you claim to live in Jesus. Whoever claims that must walk as Jesus walked. I think there's a real purpose behind this beautiful comparison of Jesus and, and Stephen. And he's saying, this, this is what you should strive for. This is the kind of life that you should live. Now, I, I don't usually read poetry in my sermons. 
you know, three points in a poem, and you got your sermon done. Don't usually do that. But as I prepared this lesson, an old song from my childhood just kept coming back and coming back. I, and many of you may recognize it. In fact, if you do recognize it, I want you to tell me. I could not find this, and I have got a collection of hymn books, and I couldn't find it anywhere. Had to Google it and go online and find it. I did that, Chris. <laughs> By myself. <laughs> Many of you will recognize this, and I hope this is our prayer as we leave here today. It was written by Charles Gabriel in 1906, the year that Yancey Jones was born. And um, <laughs> written by, you know, Charles Gabriel, he uh, wrote, I Stand Amazed. He's the same man who wrote the words to that song. But here's the song, More Like the Master. This is our, I hope this will be our prayer for today. More like the master I would ever be. More of his meekness, more humility. More zeal to labor, more courage to be true. More consecration for work he bids me do. More like the master is my daily prayer. More strength to carry crosses I must bear. More earnest effort to bring his kingdom in. More of his spirit, the wanderer to win. More like the master I would live and grow. More of his love to others I would show. More self-denial like his in Galilee. More like the master I long to ever be. I hope that's your prayer, your desire. I hope that's what you strive for throughout this week. To be like Stephen and to be like Jesus. And this is my prayer, oh God, help us to be like him.